Hello, I'm Dr. Paula Rosen. I'm the publisher of Education Update, and it's my great honor to be here today with the head of the Windward School in New York, in White Plains, New York, Dr. Jay Russell, and with the chair of the Board of Trustees, Devin Fredericks. Uh, they are here with me today to talk about special education, language-based learning disabilities, and the Windward School. So, Jay, can you tell us a little bit about the history of the Windward School? Sure. Uh, the school started out in 1926 uh, as a pretty typical progressive day school. Uh, it, moved, it was in, located in New Rochelle, and then in the unlikely uh, time to make a move, uh, the then head of the school, Isabel Greenbaum Stone, uh, and a few of her friends got together, and in 1929, right in the teeth of the stock market crash, uh, raised enough money to purchase a farm-like uh, piece of property in White Plains, New York, uh, which is on Windward Avenue, and the school became the Windward School, and it's been on there since 1929. Initially, as I said, operating as a progressive day school, uh, and then in 1988, and thereabouts in the 1980s, uh, the school really focused its attention on learning disabilities. And then when Dr. Judith Hockman became head of school, really zeroed in with laser-like precision on language-based learning disabilities. And that's what the school has been specializing in ever since then. So for the last 30, almost 40 years now, uh, we've been uh, really honing our expertise on teaching children with language-based learning disabilities. I find it interesting that you said it started in 1929, which was the depths of the Depression in this country. And out of the depths of the Depression, this wonderful school arose to help people who are also in the depths of difficulties, of learning difficulties, and helps them to reach newer heights. Um, so Devin, can you tell us something about the kind of uh, students and your experience with the school? How did you become involved with the Windward School? I am very learning disabled myself, and when I saw my children struggling in school, I realized they were having the same problems I had had, and I looked around for, I had them tested, and I looked around for a school that could address their language-based learning disabilities. My son Oliver commuted from New York to Windward for six years because there was not an appropriate school for him in New York. Uh, he was very successfully remediated. He's a college student today. I don't think any of that would have been possible without Windward's work. Um, I came to understand the school's methodology and program and to embrace it and to want to make it available to more children. It's very, very difficult to get a seat in, in the two, one of the, the two campuses in White Plains. It's very hard to get into the school because the demand is so great. And I became a member of the Board of Trustees eight years ago and have been board chair for five years. Well, that's a wonderful story. Um, Jay, can you tell us something about uh, the kinds of programs that the school has? Uh, what distinguishes Windward? By the way, for those of you who are not uh, in the tri-state area, the Windward School is located in White Plains, New York, which is just about 45 minutes north of Manhattan. Um, so can you tell us something about the special programs that are available and what distinguishes this school from others? I think it's um, more accurate to talk about what distinguishes it than special programs. Uh, but let me start with special programs. Because we're a school for children with language-based learning disabilities, our focus is on language, on reading, writing, listening, and speaking. Uh, however, we offer a comprehensive uh, educational program that is parallel to the New York State curriculum. 50% um, of our students come to us from public schools, 50% from independent schools. And on uh, between three and five years on average, students leave us and return to mainstream. They don't return to special education programs, they return to mainstream schools. Okay. Well, it, thank you, uh, it, and it's a credit to the students and the teachers, but the reason I mention that is because, just to underscore the fact that it is a New York State curriculum, and the children are able to return to those mainstream schools seamlessly, and we, we track them after they leave. So 
having said that, uh, we use an Orton Gillingham based uh, reading program uh, that was developed by one of our um, the former director of education uh, at Winward, who's still on our faculty of our Teacher Training Institute, Phyllis Burton, and Eileen Perlman developed a program called Preventing Academic Failure. And it's a Orton Gillingham based reading program, and it does a great job of moving students through skill by skill by skill uh, through decoding uh, so that they become accurate and then fluent readers. Uh, at the same time, we also use a program that Judith Hockman developed, Teaching Basic Writing Skills. You may have seen a piece in Atlantic Magazine this month, uh, which details the success that uh, Dr. Hockman's program had at New Dorp High School uh, in Staten Island. Uh, well, it was originated and first used in Windward, and we still use it, and we serve as a, a model for other schools that they come to see the program in action. So that reading and writing program are really critical. But that doesn't really give you the full picture. Um, what we uh, really focus on is the use of direct explicit instruction in all of our classes. And all of our teachers are trained in using direct explicit instruction. Now, can you define that for sure. those people who don't know? Every lesson has certain components, and every lesson has to be prepared by our teachers. So one of the things that makes us different, this almost sounds like a Seder, why is this night different from all others? The school is different because one of the things we do is we group children homogeneously for reading and for math. So for skills-based programs, they're grouped homogeneously at skill level with about 10 children in a, in a group. So that allows our teachers to pinpoint a lesson to the skills that the students are still trying to master, as opposed to having a heterogeneous group where the skill level is all over the place and not pinpointing the lesson. So every lesson has an aim, every lesson has a motivation, and then every lesson has direct instruction, explicit instruction from the teacher based on whatever that skill is. Then there's an opportunity for guided practice and feedback, immediate feedback is another uh, important component of direct instruction, and then independent work with a teacher checking it. So every lesson in every class. So the other thing that makes us different, at Winward, we train all of our teachers. Uh, no teacher, whether they came, came to us with 10 years experience, 5 years experience, or 25 years experience, no teacher walks into Winward and begins teaching. You have to go through our teacher training program, uh, which uh, has an extensive course list, and you have to work in the classroom of one of our uh, master teachers for at least a year. Uh, more typically, it's two years. So that's like a student teaching experience. Most of our people have been through student teaching, right, so, so it's beyond student teaching. But it's teaching. a supervision of this type of teaching. Yes, it is. Uh, and it's an opportunity to actually see it at work in a classroom live with real kids in a real learning situation. And uh, depending on the qualifications and the skill level of those uh, new teachers, we'll let them get more uh, experience in class. So they'll teach a lesson with the master teacher observing it and one of our curriculum people observing it. So the other thing that makes when we're different is that every one of our teachers, whether you teach art, phys ed, math, science, or language arts and social studies, you must be expert in the teaching of language. And so we teach all of our teachers the structure of language. We spend a lot of time uh, teaching teachers how to ask questions and how to scaffold questions so that they can help the children uh, access information and so that they can accurately assess where the students are. So there's a lot of pieces that make the school different, but there's a gestalt to the school uh, that is really about the true mean, truest meaning I've ever seen of a community of learners. So we don't accept where um, we're done learning. We're always continuously learning. So every Friday, uh, we release students at 1.30. And every Friday, the whole faculty, from the least experienced to the most experienced, That's wonderful. goes through professional development. So long answer. Sorry. No, no, no. That's wonderful. Devin, can you speak to the... Um kinds of stories that you've heard from students about the schools they've come from and Windward and some of the 
names and some of the difficulties that they've had. You were kind enough to share a book with me recently by a Pulitzer Prize winner, Philip, Philip Schultz, who spoke about his learning disability. And it was very poignant because he verbalized how people were insulting to him, whether it was in the classroom or others. So can you share some of those stories with us? It's very common that perfectly well-meaning teachers will say very insulting things to these kids. They simply don't understand their problems. I mean, I was always, uh, they always said about me, oh, she's such a nice girl. We wish she would work harder. I couldn't have worked any harder. It wasn't a question of working harder. It was a question of being taught differently. Did you go to school here in New York City? I did go to public and private schools in New York City and barely made it through high school. Um, <laughs> We have a panel every spring at Windward where students who have left the school come back from public schools, independent schools, boarding schools, and talk about that experience. And it's a, for many, it's a wonderful experience. They're thriving. They're doing well. They're in a mainstream school. They're taking advanced placement courses. But they still have to advocate for themselves. And some of the teachers just don't get it. And you hear, again, these insensitive things that teachers say, you know, open mouth, insert foot. Um, they, I'm sure they don't mean it, but it's hard to believe in the 21st century that these kinds of things come out of professionals' mouths. So part, I think, of the emphasis of the Teacher Training Institute, which you are now expanding, and there's, in fact, a new building uh, up in, um, in White Plains, um, part of that emphasis will be on sensitizing teachers and other professionals as to how to handle the children, not just techniques, but the psychological uh, ramifications. Is that, Jay, is that correct? Well, I, I wouldn't say it's um, focused on that as a, as a unique course or program. I, I think that what happens, as Devin said, I think most of our um, professionals are very well intended and, and they're trying to do the right thing. Unfortunately, uh, I think that pre-service education programs, even graduate education programs, uh, don't adequately prepare teachers um, to teach reading in general, even to the general population. But in particular, they don't do a good job of teaching uh, teachers how to teach children with learning disabilities. And so as a result, uh, there is a, a lack of information that could be viewed as a lack of sensitivity, but I don't think that's really what it is. I really think these teachers enter the profession with the best of intentions. They want to help children, but because they don't understand the nature of, of the children's learning issues, they make lots and lots of errors. Uh, some of them extraordinarily disturbing. We had a case where um, one of our parents went through a committee on special education program, you know, being identified. Uh, and after the results were done, um, the parents said, you know, I, I know my child has a learning disability. Uh, and the psychologist who, was the, a psychologist who was the chair of the committee said to her, oh, no, he couldn't possibly have a learning disability. And she said, why? And his, uh, the response was, he's too smart. His IQ is too high. So that's a psychologist. So, again, I don't think that was intentional. So in the course of going through TTI courses and going through the program, I think a lot of the people go through those have their own personal epiphany without us needing to pinpoint specifics. Uh, but you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, there, there are way too many children who are um, not being treated properly. Uh, again, I, I, I don't believe there's a, uh, any kind of uh, purpose to it in most cases. Now, what was the rationale behind having a whole new building put up for the Teacher Training Institute? Obviously, there are more people that need to be trained, and you want to reach out to those. Well, I'd like Devin to respond first, because she was a critical uh, piece in this. It was her vision about um, the school that really led us to that. So do you want to jump in first? The board, uh, in, in doing their strategic planning uh, five years ago, uh, really felt a very strong uh, mandate to uh, make the program available to more children. And it, we did demographic studies, we did a lot of research, but we identified training more teachers as the crucial element in expanding the program. 
and that our own teacher training institute was ideally suited to do that. So a decision was made to raise the money to build an appropriate building for the teacher training institute. And we had the pleasure last week of dedicating the Judith C. Hockman building of the Winter Teacher Training Institute. A that very, is, very gratifying. That's a milestone. You cut that ribbon. So it's not just for your own teachers in your school, but it's for teachers who are in other programs as well that you have this institute now. So anybody within any part of the United States who wants to come and learn can come during the year or during the summertime and can look up this Windward Teacher Training Institute. Is that correct? Well, I just I would expand on that. We actually had uh, teachers come from Australia and from Israel uh, over the past year. So I would wouldn't limit the geographic. Okay, it's to international. Just, it it's is international. It truly is fabulous. And just fabulous. You're quite right, though. It's uh, there's courses offered, a full range of courses that are offered throughout the year and throughout the summer. And this year we will be offering. Uh, a satellite courses here in New York City. So the international focus is really amazing. And is that the direction that you're going to be going in now? Not just the, the tri-state area, not just the United States of America, but internationally. Uh, we, we do have uh, a very, very ambitious vision for the school. Uh, however, uh, one of the, we have two important catchphrases that guide everything we do. So one is transform more lives because we've heard that over and over again from our students and parents that we transform the lives of the student and the family, frankly. And the second catchphrase that we use is preserve the sacred. And that's something that Devin uh, gave us. And so what did you mean by that? Devin, please expand on that. That you know, we have 557 students in Westchester right now, and they must receive the program, you know, at the very highest level of excellence every day. So, and next year and the year after. So protecting the sacred, preserving the sacred is really intended to make sure that the program in Westchester, in White Plains, continues perfectly as it is every day before we think about expanding. And we believe that with the Teacher Training Institute, we can continue to deliver an excellent program in Westchester and think about expanding to New York City. That's terrific. So the expansion to New York City that you are envisioning is becoming a reality soon. And, um, you know, how many more students do you think you can reach? You have 557 in White Plains. And what do you think you'll have in New York City, Manhattan? Well, right now, um, while it's still... Uh, in the planning stages, it's moved along quite nicely, uh, and we're fairly confident by September uh, 2015 we will be opening a facility uh, that will allow us to educate 350 additional students. Um, and, you know, I, if I go back, I missed a very important piece when you asked me what makes when we're different, and, and Devin's preserving the sacred comment reminded me of the fact that and I, I don't think I unders I don't think I stated this explicitly, and I should have. Everything we do is based on research, and so that is really what distinguishes us. It's a research-based program, and it's hard research. It's not anecdote. Um, it's not pleasant stories about well, I saw somebody else do this in another classroom, and it right. seemed to work fine. It's work that comes out of uh, the National Reading Panel. Uh, IDA has a uh, huge body of research that guides everything we do in the classroom. So uh, as a result of that, since it is research-based, we insist that our teachers deliver it within certain specifications. And so we believe that they have to adopt the program, not adapt the program, in order to get the same results. And we get great results because we uh, train our teachers, uh, and then we carefully monitor what they're doing and supervise them and evaluate them continuously. Mm -hmm. And then we give them additional support based on those observations and supervision. So sorry to go back, but I, no, I realized no, I, I really did, I didn't do it justice. That's a very important point. Now, do teachers get in-service credits or can use some of the courses that they are going to take or are taking at the Teacher Training Institute for a master's degree or... Um, you know, the ex extra credit sometimes you get for advancement in your salary? Yes, uh, they do that uh, frequently. And in fact, um, we have uh, an agreement with Manhattanville College that allows uh, teachers to get 
graduate credit uh, for courses that they take at the TTI uh, through Manhattanville. Uh, so they do use it for movement across the salary schedule in the public schools. In independent schools, we don't have that structure, uh, but in public schools they do, and the teachers are able to uh, receive salary credit for all the courses that we offer. So it seems to me that maybe you should videotape some of these wonderful lessons and these teachers, and let's let this go really around the world. We've got to make Windward into the international name. So we are, that is part of our strategic plan uh, to work that through, but I, I do need to tell you that we also believe in multi-century education, and um, it's kind of interesting when you think of multi-century education being given online or through the web, uh, that limits that multi-sensory piece of it. But having said that, uh, I think that is very much the next phase of the Teacher Training Institute, uh, and we have already begun to explore that. So there may be an online component for the Teacher Training Institute. Stay is that tuned. correct? Yes. We will stay tuned, absolutely. Um, last question for me. Um, is there any particular a uh, poignant episode or story or anecdote that stands out in your mind, maybe something that happened at a graduation ceremony or um, anything of that nature? I think Sorry. every Windward parent has, you know, the story of the uh, application process and the day their student was offered a seat at Windward. You know, tears come to my eyes just thinking about it. We've had extraordinary graduation speakers come back from college, from their professional world, and talk to the students who are leaving about their experiences. I mean, pretty much every day something uh, emotional. <laughs> you know, it's tough to pick one yeah. for me, but I do have, uh, so I'm going to, tell you two little anecdotes. So the first was when I was uh, being interviewed to be head of school. Uh, the Board of Trustees at that time did a intergalactic search for the next head of the Windward School. <laughs> How many years ago are we talking about, Jake? Seven years ago. Eight, actually, I think the inter this is my seventh year, so the interview w was eight years ago. So um, it, it was very intense uh, and you know, they really covered every aspect of your knowledge of pedagogy, programs, research, interactions with people. And so it was a really intense interview. You met with the trustees, then you met with parents, then you met with the teachers. Then I met with the students. And this is the part that I remember the most. So we sat at a table, and these were middle school age students, so they were 12 and 13. And, you know, they were asking me the typical math school questions. Uh, can we have more dances? Uh, <laughs> what can you do about the food in the cafeteria? Yeah, of course. Why do we have a dress code? You know, tough questions like that. And so we, I guess I did okay and uh, answered the questions. Then I s said to the children, I said, you know, you've asked me a lot of great questions. Is there anything you want me to know about your school that we haven't covered? I still, I remember the, Jeffrey raised his hands immediately. And he said, yes. He said, I want you to know, this was a 12-year-old boy, I want you to know the school saved my life. Oh. So I'm, wonderful. I'm taken back, and I'm saying, this, is this a setup? Because <laughs> he's 12 years old? And there must have been 15 or so kids in the room. Every single one of them were nodding their heads, was nodding their he his or her head in agreement uh, with Jeffrey. So that's one anecdote that's I'll tell you. That's an incredible and heartwarming story. I'm getting tears in my eyes. Wow. I wasn't even there. And you remember it from eight years ago. Oh, you'd never forget something like that. Sure. And the other is one of my trustees recommended that we put up a board with the colleges and universities that Winwood students go to. Great idea. And were intended. Well, I responded a little differently, Paula. I said, you know, I said, look, we're an elementary school. We're a middle school. We don't want to overemphasize college. There's plenty of time for that. And I still remember what he said. He said, Jay, you don't understand. He said, when parents get to the front door of Winwood, some of them have been so demoralized. They've struggled so mightily with so, many, uh, so much of the bureaucracy trying to get something for their children. She, he said, if you do that, it'll immediately give them another sense of hope. So I said, you know what? 
you're absolutely right. So we put it up, and I can't tell you how many parents stop, parents, prospective parents, stop and look at that sign and note it and say, make a comment to me about that it accomplished exactly what that trustee suggested it would and, and gave them a different perspective and hope again. So uh, those are just two stories. Well, I, I think that's a wonderful story, and I think both of you inspire tremendous hope in the students and the parents that you serve so well at the Windward School, and we're looking forward to your expansion into New York City. And thank you for being here with us today. Thank you, Paula. Thank you, Paula.